G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel, continuing our off-season series where I go through each individual AFL team and I have a little look at their best 22, a little bit of a look at their off-season and sort of a projection, I guess, of how things are going to go in 2024 and beyond. So if you've been keeping up with the series, you'll know that I have been doing this in reverse alphabetical order, which meant I start with the Western Bulldogs all the way through to now Geelong in today's video, which is a very, very interesting one. I mean, they're all interesting to an extent. I'm getting a lot out of this series, and I hope you are too. Uh, but I think Geelong as well are fascinating. I've used this term before, but list management case study. They really are, because they do things a little bit differently in Geelong. And uh, over the years, they've been um, maybe not criticized, but there has been a degree of concern of you know the drop-offs coming for Geelong, but they continue to defy the odds. Other than in 2023, where they obviously missed the finals, so looking in and digging deeper into where their list is at is actually been a pretty fun exercise and I'm intrigued to see what happens next. For those who want to find the rest of the content, uh, I have been uploading it pretty recently, but we are seeing the start of the big bash league tournament starting up. So I've been doing season preview content uh, for those teams as well. Having said that though, if you want to find it all in one spot, there is a playlist on this channel called uh, team based videos for 2024 and you can find all the videos up to date. For anyone who's been keeping up with it in real time, I do assure you I am 100% committed to finish, finishing this series. I know there's a bit of concern that I might lose interest or now that the cricket season's here, I might not get all the way to Adelaide, but I promise you I will do. Whether they all come out at the same pace uh, still remains to be seen. I've been doing a couple a day at the moment, um, but that might become one a day. Or we'll see what happens. It depends how juicy the Big Bash season uh, is. But anyway, let's talk about the Geelong Football Club, who after a uh, commanding grand final victory in 2022, in a year where, again, People will like to write them off going into that season, saying they're getting too old. Their best is past them. They uh, they came out and smashed their expectations and won the premiership by, what, 80 points in the end of the grand final. Subsequently, 2023 was the year that things sort of fell apart for the Cats, and not in dramatic fashion, but obviously they were one spot off their worst ever finish in the AFL, so you can't say that things went to plan by uh, any stretch of the imagination, though. But, the, the, I mean, the next question is, like, to what extent is that uh, their new reality? Is this them falling out of the finals and are they going to stay there? Or have they got something else up their sleeve? Do they have uh, it in them for another push? Their list is getting old. It is getting old. But to focus on 2023 for a moment, I mean, uh, I think on the surface level, it appears that maybe the retirement of Joel Selwood did hurt um, as much or perhaps more than we expected. I think their midfield, you know, didn't really hit the mark this year and it didn't help that someone like Cam Guthrie also only played six games. They were a little bit exposed on that front. Uh, the forwards actually clicked pretty well. You know, Hawkins and Cameron, in particular Jeremy Cameron, his start to the season was unreal, but the overall output from those guys um, was once again fantastic. They combined for over 100 goals. We saw a brilliant season from Ollie Henry, his career best season, obviously recruited from Collingwood and a young talent, 41 goals he kicked in the end. Brian Myers, he may not have hit the scoreboard a lot, but I think he rated, he had the second most um, goal assists ever or something like that. Anyway, he, he had a fantastic season as kind of like a high half forward, kicking the ball inside 50. Stengel probably didn't uh, replicate, you know, his brilliant AA form, but he still kicked 27 goals. It wasn't a bad season by any stretch. But I mean, with the team boasting this much forward half firepower, uh, the overall result wasn't great. And I probably put it down looking at it on a surface level as not enough ball winners through the midfield. Obviously, without Selwood and much of Guthrie this year, I think their highest disposal winner on average was Tom Stewart. And when he's a uh, intercepting defender, that's probably a, not a great sign that your, your midfielders are getting their hands on the ball. So overall, the season didn't go you know as expected, um, with Geelong always having lofty expectations. I do think, though, well, I'm not a fan of the Cats as such. I'm obviously an Eagles fan, but I do wonder if their fans are fairly relaxed about the way the season went, given they won the premiership the year before. So I guess in this video, I'm going to try and dig deep into, well, first of all, I'm going to I'm gonna have a crack at their best 22 and uh, see where I see their list going going forward because that's an interesting question for the Cats. Like what is both the short and the medium term hold for them? Before I have a crack at the best 22, we'll cover the list changes. So the cuts that they made to their list, either involuntary or voluntary, I guess through retirement. You had Isaac Smith retire, Asava Radaglia joined Port Adelaide, uh, Sam Menegola left, Sam Simpson, Oscar Riccardi, Cooper White, and then the veteran in Jonathan Segler, oh, and also Flynn Kruger. I'm not gonna lie, I don't know a lot about some of those lower names there. But we saw them have a very draft-focused off-season, which I think um, you know, was kind of telegraphed. I think Andrew Mackey said it on, uh, 
uh, on afl.com.au that that was going to be the focus, uh, transitioning the list. And they have done a pretty good job over that over the course of the last few years to do that. Obviously, getting that trade in for Jack Bowes, which allowed them, you know, pick eight to take Jai Clark. And in general, there's been a, a bit of a push towards a more youthful uh, recruitment policy. And we saw them take five draft picks, in fact, six draft picks this year. And I, I quite like the mix. So that included Connor O'Sullivan, Mitch Edwards, Sean Manor, George Stevens, Oliver Wiltshire, Lawson Humphreys, and then in the rookie draft, they've drafted Hawthorne's Emerson Jecker. So a nice mix there of both tall and small. Um, they've obviously gone for a key back, a Ruckman, and then a, a couple of mature recruits as well. Um, Sean Manor is 26, the best performed VFL player this year, and someone who I think can have an immediate impact. Uh, Stevens was a youngster, but I think I think Oliver Wiltshire might also have been mature age. Forgive me, I didn't actually write that down, but I do remember there was a mix of ages with a lot of their recruits, which makes sense. They're obviously about to foresee a transition of their list, like whether they like it or not, there's going to be a lot of veterans that make way. And so, you know, having a couple of extra extra players who were recruited who are perhaps 20, 21, gives them that extra year of you know physical development. So I'm gonna have a crack at their 22. Bearing in mind again, I'm not a I'm not a fan. I don't watch Geelong as closely as I do my Eagles. So what I've done, I've, I've picked a pretty conservative 22 that might actually be different from the one we see line up in round one and beyond. But this is what I went with. Um, the back line there, the back line is solid enough. I think in terms of the talls, it's a little bit short, isn't it, with Asava Radaglia leaving and no obvious replacement. So Jack Henry is obviously there. Sam De Koning is a good player, premiership player. Tom Stewart is obviously a champion of the game. So it's a it's a competitive back three, but I think uh, longer term, they'll probably want uh, to bolster that part of the ground. That being said, they've obviously drafted Conor O'Sullivan. I'm just talking about best 22 right now. In terms of the median types, I've, sl- I've slapped Duncan on a halfback flank, Zach Guthrie in the back. Uh, this one was tough, but deciding between Jed Buse and Mark O'Connor for the last spot on the bench. Um, I felt like it's fairly even there, so Cats fans might be able to have a different opinion. I imagine there's probably some diverse opinions, so let me know in the comments section below. The midfield is probably where it looks pretty light for me, even with the reintroduction of Guthrie, and even picking Pat Dangerfield in that on-ball division. There's Tom Atkins there. Holmes is someone I've got on the wing. Blitzarves on the other wing, but Holmes might be one that they transition into a more of an inside mid role. I think that was flirted with in the preseason last year, but they're probably going to do something. They've got to cycle in some more midfield talent because uh, none of those guys are particularly young. I think Guthrie's 32, Danger will be 34 next year, I think. Uh, And Atkins, I'm not sure exactly, but he's at least in his late 20s. I think he's around my age. So the need to transition midfielders through this side is already there. We do know they've recruited Tanner Brun, and so far, so good. He looks pretty good. Uh, I've picked Jack Bowes as a sub here. I think he's been one that's earmarked for potentially more midfield time, obviously playing a fair bit of defense as well. I've just got him as my sub option, but again, it was a little bit tricky. The forward line that I've picked here, I think is fairly strong still. I think that is clearly the strength of this best 22. Not only have you got Cameron and Hawkins, I know Hawkins is going to turn 36 this year, Jeremy Cameron's going to turn 31, but they're still the output is still there, and they combine for 100 goals. Ollie Henry, he's a young prospect that is probably starting to enter his prime with 41 goals. If he kicks that every year, geez, that's great. Uh, Tyson Stengel, again, another player that's sort of in the middle of his prime. Myers, uh, Brad Close. So not only is the firepower good, the talent's good, but the age blend is also really nice there, I think. So there's a blend of like young guys starting to um, you know, hit their mark, and it's probably just a case of replacing those key forwards, but... Again, any club would have that problem when you have two you know, absolute star um, key forwards for a number of years. Now, I have picked Gary Rowan on, Rowan on the bench, and that's probably a little bit generous. I think he 18 goals from 15 games last year or something like that. And doing a little bit of research, there's a lot of suggestions that Rowan starts outside this, this best uh, 22. But like I said, I've gone conservative, and I'm going to try and map out some of the other guys that might come in, because there's guys like Ollie Dempsey, maybe. He saw a little bit of football last year. I have picked Sean Manet in this team, and I think uh, I'm, I'm happy with that. I picked him on the bench there. And I think he will have a pretty immediate impact as a probably forward midfielder. Again, they could probably use some reinforcement in the midfield in this particular team. But let's go through some of the other players I left out. Like I said, I didn't pick uh, Mark O'Connor. Perhaps I've got that wrong. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't really work out who to leave out of that team. And Zach Tui is another one that I think is you pretty much universally expected to not play round one. Um, but those are probably the next two backup options that I'm aware of. In terms of their key backs, I think with this situation, Conor O'Sullivan probably could get a little bit of a look at it this year. I'm not saying he's going to debut round one, but you know, it, depending on how this season goes, we could see O'Sullivan play. And I think as an interceptor, he could you know, get a bit of a taste of AFL. Not play 20 games, but maybe plays five. Emerson Jacker, I think, is one that the obviously rookie listed from Hawthorne. Earmarked somewhat for a potential key defensive role as well. So slightly more mature, obviously, than um, Conor O'Sullivan. 
The next evolution of their midfield is probably the other the query for me. So they've got Brun, I've picked on the bench. Jai Clark, a top 10 pick. No complaints there. There's a bit of belief that Mitch Nevitt as well was a decent player at the next level. Big, tall inside mid um, with a bit of upside, that's for sure. Then there's a big question mark on Brandon Parfit, someone that was been highly rated earlier in his career. Um, didn't have the best year. I think he's ended the year well. I think he had one of his best games in that final round against the Bulldogs. So he's probably there as depth. And it's one of those things where, you know, I've picked Parfit, Clark, and Nevitt out of this team. But throughout the course of this year, I think it's really important that they cycle these guys through. And I think they're probably in a position to just sort of wait for injuries, perhaps. Uh, or, you know, just make these guys earn their spot in the team, which is fair enough. As for the forwards, I mentioned Ollie Dempsey as probably being one that we could see feature in this forward line, perhaps for Gary Rowan round one. Who knows? Uh, again, the outsider looking in. In terms of their key forwards, you know, I don't know who the next best is. You know, we've, we've seen a bit of Shannon Neal um, as a key forward. So there may be a desire to get him some games this year. I think that's going to be important. And I think probably... Phoenix Foster is another player they took at pick 52 in 2022 that we haven't seen yet, but it's very early days. So, I mean, there's, there's two sort of simultaneous analysis is happening here. Like we're, I'm assessing the strength of the best 22 for this, the season of 2024, in which case you'd say, you know, the back line's solid, midfield's a bit weak, and the forward line is very dangerous. I'd say those are their strengths. As for the midfield, I, I think this is the time where we need to start well, they need to start plotting the the evolution of what this future midfield is going to look like when you consider, um, you know, there's probably Tanner Brun in there. Do they see Jack Bowes as part of that midfield mix? Brennan Parfit, again, he probably needs to start really establishing himself at AFL level. Max Holmes, potentially. I do like the look of him. Obviously, it's another question whether he can become a primary on baller as an inside mid rather than just a wingman where I've picked him. Jai Clark is obviously a talented player. Um, and then, you know, maybe they can pluck George Stevens and from pick 58 or whatever he was, he can become an on-baller. On I think Geelong historically have been good at picking late in drafts. So there is a degree of faith there that they'll, they'll see their way through it. But I'm just saying on the surface level, looking at the next evolution of that midfield, it definitely needs some reinforcement. What I do think the Cats have done well from a recruitment point of view though, is they have drafted talls lately. So when you consider the two key position defenders, you know, Sam DeConing's already a premiership player, drafted in 2019, I think. So yeah, still got plenty of football left ahead of him, not even in his prime. Uh, there's also, of course, Conor O'Sullivan, who I think is a high-level talent. They've got two young rucks on the list. Toby Conway's, you know, decent. Um, but Mitch Edwards, again, another player that I think has a lot of upside. So, you know, they've had one eye on the future, obviously, for a while now. And stockpiling tools first is actually a pretty good strategy, in my opinion. Then they've also got two young key forwards, like I mentioned, in Neil and Foster, who are probably the more of the question marks. I'd say that the key backs there are really good in De Koning and O'Sullivan. Uh, the rucks look decent and the forwards are still a bit of an unknown from an outsider looking in. So with that all being said, like what do we forecast here for the Geelong Cats? Now, I've always been really hesitant to mark them down and, and predict them to miss the finals because they keep proving us wrong, other than 2023, of course. Um, but now that I really look and analyze this list and I'm, I'm concerned at how old it is and the unprovenness of the guys coming in. Geelong have always done pretty well at developing the talent they have from modest draft picks. It also also helped that they're good at recruiting players you know, from other clubs like Jeremy Cameron, for instance. But what I think could happen this year is I think obviously Geelong are very cognizant of where they're at in terms of list transition. And we're not gonna see Geelong, in my opinion, just roll out with the same most experienced possible 22 um, that they generally do. Maybe I'm oversimplifying it there, but I think there will be a legitimate focus on giving Brun as much time at you know center bounces as possible. Maybe Parfit gets more of a look in than he previously would if Geelong's focus is changing. We might see a lot of these veterans who are slightly underperforming potentially, or even if they're performing to standard, uh, we might see them pushed aside a little bit, which will affect Geelong's ladder position. So. On the whole, looking at this, I think with the star potential that this team has, I don't really forecast the bottom four finish, but it does kind of rely on some aging veterans to fire on all cylinders again, like a Pat Dangerfield, like a Tom Hawkins. Blitz Arbs is another one, you know, he's 34 or something, or 33 at the moment, might be 34 at the end of next year. And you forecast the potential retirements that this team has in 12 months time. And I'm just going to list players that are out of contract. So Tom Hawkins will be 36 this time next year. Mitch Duncan and Gary Rowan and Reece Stanley will all be 34. Again, they're all out of contract. Zach Tui's 34 next year. Cam Guthrie, 32. Out of that lot, I can see Guthrie playing on, but there's a serious chance that all five of those guys retire, particularly ones that aren't getting games. 
Therefore, you know, I don't think the Cats are in a position to just play those guys until they've run out of tickets and, and then worry about what happens next. I think we're going to see a very experimental 22 at times throughout this year. Again, outside of looking in, but I think what will happen is we'll see a real mixed bag from Geelong this year. Again, they're probably too good to finish bottom four, uh, but... It, if it was anyone else, I'd probably be ranking them as a real bottom four chance. So I do expect that they'll be active in next year's free agency space because I think they're going to well and truly be protecting their draft capital. I don't really see a first rounder leaving Geelong this year unless it's for someone like Bailey Smith. And that would make sense to some extent because I think they have both a list need in their under 21s but they also have a list need in, in the guys that are about 24, 25, like whatever Bailey Smith is exactly. But Bailey Smith might be a candidate. Um, that's one player that they could trade for. Um, but then I, I've gone through and listed some free agents uh, or potential free agents, whether they're restricted or unrestricted. So Sean Darcy, the link's been there for a while. Again, Reece Stanley's going to be 34 at the end of the year. I don't know if they're ready for Conway and Edwards to lead the ruck going forward. There may be someone else on the list that I've missed there, but um, either way. But there's some potentially cheaper options like Ben Keys. Potentially, he's an unrestricted free agent, I think, because he was delisted once. According to Footy Wire, he's unrestricted. Um, there's Jared Berry. Uh, well, I could see it. Geelong, Andrew McGrath. Like, the premise for them going after potential free agents is that they can protect their draft capital. Obviously, restricted free agents can be matched. Uh, they'll probably want to avoid that scenario, but potentially they could pry some of these guys loose. And if they were going to trade, maybe, you know, they showed some interest in Ollie Lord from Port Adelaide last year. But failing that, Todd Marshall is also a free agent. And I do see a very short-term need and long-term need for a key position forward into this, this team as it transitions. Another left-field one is Jermaine Jones. He actually used to play for the Cats or at least be on the list. Not sure if he played a game, to be honest. Um, but he's quietly made a little name for himself at West Coast and uh, is an unrestricted free agent as of next year as well. Um, and he's a Geelong local from memory. So those are some little money ball options they could use to help smooth out their list transition. But either way, I, I'm gonna be watching Geelong with some interest for sure. I was thinking as I was doing this video, like if there was a equivalent of, you know, a football manager for AFL, Geelong is the team that I'd probably pick or Richmond just because it's gonna be, it's gonna be challenging. This is a very challenging list position that Geelong are in. The thing is though, they routinely find their way through it. I don't know if the, the situation has ever looked so challenging as it does right now with, with some of their absolute guns really on the way out, but the the earned advantage Geelong have had, it's not, it's not an inherited advantage, it's an earned advantage, is that they often get players who want to come play for the Cats. You know, you look at Pat Dangerfield, you look at uh, Jeremy Cameron, sure that they're, they're kind of locals, right? I'm not sure off the top of my head, but I think they're both locals, which helps, but it really helps that Geelong have been a strong organization with a great culture, always competitive, and I think Maybe they'll have that in mind if they're trying to lure someone onto their list, you know, in 12 months time, 24 months time, they're going to be cognizant of the fact that they don't want to be presenting as a bottom 14 in that time. But anyway, I'm just kind of spewing thoughts at this point. I think uh, they're going to be a fascinating watch. Um, you know, it's you have to respect Geelong as a football club. While I look at the list and I see concern, I'd be concerned if that was the Eagles list profile, which just as an aside, I'm not suggesting the Eagles have a great list profile either. It was just a general comment. If my team looked like this, I'd be concerned but it is a Geelong football club and they've proven that they can get themselves to relevance, you know, very quickly and when it seems against the odds as well. So anyway, guys, that's my take on the Geelong Cats. Let me know in the comment section what you agree with and disagree with and what I might have missed out on. Obviously, I'm still kind of getting in touch with every list on a, on a deeper level. That's kind of the point of this, uh, this exercise, but uh, I hope this was interesting for you. So as always, I appreciate you watching and I will see you in the next video. Cheers.